color. And now I feel bad about Old saying color. that, you know. Oh, that reminds me because uh, someone had accused me of teasing you and making fun of you and stuff like that. And I say old feller because you you were just talking about antiques and stuff like that, which was is a well, lot of fun. I love that topic. And uh, then I said this, and I was like, oh, no, that person's going to think I'm being mean to Martin again. No, actually, um, I I take that uh, remark well because I've, um, I, I do – I am a lover of antiques, which is kind of a uh, – antiques and UFOs don't really mix, but unless you're – In a way, you know, I You guess. want to try to – Ancient aliens? I don't know. Maybe. Well, even 1947, <laughs> when all those, you know, the the government was looking into UFOs, that was way before my time. So yeah. that's that's yeah. kind of antiquish to me. <laughs> it is. It um, but anyway, um, having fun here in New Hampshire, getting ready for an estate sale, so uh, finding some real goodies, having cool. a good time. That's awesome. Yeah. That's fun. And I should say, and I, I'm going to take this opportunity to say that I certainly do not intend to disparage or make fun of you at all, Martin. In fact, just the fact that I have you on my show demonstrates that that very, very, very high level of respect. I'm having fun, and, and I hope nobody feels like you know I, I'm I'm um, making fun of Martin or or making them look badly i i'm certainly not trying to uh because i think the world of martin willis and you know it's great to take the chance to say uh i think martin willis is a super duper awesome and uh, i really love talking ufos with you so it's it's a pleasure to to talk with you every week so um wow i hope you never have felt that i've made fun of you i haven't meant to no yeah. No, all, all in good fun, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm speechless. That's uh, very nice. Really? Of you. Thank See, and the awkward yes. pauses and stuff. That's fun. That's charming. That's not well, a bad thing. I, I, in my eyes, I don't th- feel it as a bad thing. Yeah, on my own show, I was known to do awkward well. You know, way back. <laughs> yeah. So, it takes a certain knack. It you know? does, and it's fun yeah. these days. Yeah. So, moving on. Uh, let's see. Well, let me tell them about my guest. Oh, this is an exciting show, people. You're going to love this. My guest is retired Colonel Dr. Um, John Alexander. And some people may be going, oh, man, that's a disinformation dude, man. What? But you know what is funny? And what we're going to be talking about is, is also exciting, uh, a topic that people love, which is the Skinwalker Ranch. Um, oh, that's this ranch in Utah, you know, that was uh, purchased by uh, Robert Bigelow, who's a real estate mogul out of Las Vegas, who now is running Bigelow Aerospace and actually has a component on the International Space Station. He's also mm-hmm. very much a UFO enthusiast uh, into the topic. He's he's funded a lot of UFO investigations and paranormal type of investigations, including investigating this strange ranch in utah which is a favorite topic of many people and john alexander who's been friends with mr bigelow for a very long time we'll talk about how that friendship started uh in this interview uh was on the ranch and part of that whole investigation so we'll talk to john about that in fact i have an interview on youtube with him about the ranch it's one of our most viewed youtube videos and uh, so i thought that would be a lot of fun because there's been some stories about the ranch in the news lately and uh, I mm. thought it'd be fun to talk to John about it. Right. And it sold, right? It did sell, yeah. That's what those stories were. And funny enough, um, John didn't even realize that, but it has sold, so Bigelow uh, does not own it anymore. Um, and these stories essentially were about people trying to get on the ranch and everything, and these people are harassed by people. So I think they the story headline said something like, Paranormal Turns Into Prosecutable, because... Uh, they're really getting upset at these people trying to come onto their land and look for UFOs wow. and, and weirdness. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that that happening. And no trespassing is no trespassing. Exactly. You know, they can throw the law at them for sure. Yeah, but um, they could shoot I, them. They actually, there are. I think they have to be breaking into a home to shoot. Well, I don't I, know. There's anyway, like a the make laws my probably day. vary in different states. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. But um, 
John is also speaking at the UFO Congress, and that's what's funny. People call him a disinformationist because he's he was in the Army and in Army intelligence, and he looked into UFOs and other paranormal phenomena while he was in there, and because he feels that the government doesn't have much in the way of secrets, at least any organized sort of investigation that uh, people think he's a disinformation person. But he's into a lot of different stuff, as we'll find out in this interview and on his lecture uh, for at the UFO Congress, where he's going to talk about his own sighting and the other paranormal phenomena that uh, he feels are related to his sighting and this field, which I think is going to be fascinating. So um, it's great. And you know what? To his uh, In his defense... All of these conspiracies people have, there's really no proof to point to any of it. There's conjecture. There's a few. Uh, there are some witnesses and, and you know, uh, stories. I think that we've got a really good series going right now, and I'm really excited about our next UFO uh, magazine, uh, Open Minds UFO magazine, we're going to be putting on YouTube because we're delving into the files of where are these UFO investigations going and I think that's fascinating. There's some evidence and proof, but um, have you ever had him on your show? I have, yes, and uh, I really, I just remember it being a really good show. And I didn't, I, I thought I was going to get some flack about the disinformation uh, aspect of our, our conversation uh, that could be construed, someone could say it mm -hmm. was, but um, I didn't get the bad feedback like I expected, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, so he's intelligent, uh, very an interesting man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A very unique so. insight. And so I, I just, I really love talking to the guys, especially about Skinwalker. This topic is a lot of fun. So I think people yeah, are going to really yeah. love this. Um, but before we do that, how about we get into some UFO news? I got a doozy today, but, uh, you start us off. I will. Uh, this, and I sure hope we didn't do this last week, but, um, if we did, it wasn't posted on your site yet. Um, this is about a strange, luminous UFO caught on a security camera in England. Uh, the story was written by uh, Alejandro Rojas. And uh, it talks about this uh, odd, luminous orb, and I agree, I would consider it that. Um, it had to do with a uh, uh, camera that was uh, like a security-type camera. And uh, it was also motion triggered. They think their cat Alfie might have triggered it. Actually, this was uh, this happened while they was they were gone. So it's about I think it's like 42 seconds long or something like that. And what you do see is um, you see this uh, orb uh, go through the rooftops or you know by the rooftops, and then it changes direction, and comes back. Now I know from having one of these uh, IP cameras myself that. Um, you can, with a motion uh, sensor, you can get some weird images from insects and things like that. But this certainly is no insect. And uh, it, when it changes direction and comes back, it really, that was the part that was, wow, that was an amazing video. And uh, I strongly suggest to the listener check that video out. It's right on uh, Open Minds TV under one of the links called Security Camera Something. <laughs> Strange. UFO caught on security camera. Yeah, strange, yeah. luminous UFO caught on security camera in England. And, yeah, this one was weird. I think I mentioned it a bit on the last one, but I hadn't written the story, so I, there was more information, such as, I misspoke. It wasn't the cat. They said, I, I love this quote, too. They said, it couldn't have been our cat, Alfie, as he was in the cattery while we were on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I missed that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's because the I... They have catteries over there. Yeah. Wow. That's kind of neat, wow. huh? A cattery. Yeah. But... Uh, do they have doggeries, too? I don't know. It would be puppery. I would, ooh, that would be good. A puppery. For little puppies. <laughs> That'd puppery, be cuter. Puppery. But yeah, um, what's great is now I have... I also have, which I didn't have, is uh, the investigation. So John Turnbull was the investigator. He's the MUFON uh, National Director for Great Britain. And he uh, closed it as insufficient data. Although, I think that, I don't know, I think you could argue unknown might have been good because he essentially said uh, that he interviewed the people, he looked at the video, he said there's clearly a bright white object that appears 
to be under some sort of control and it comes back, uh, changes direction and has sort of a trail that it's leaving. Uh, so he mm-hmm. can't classify it as conventional. And since he is unable to elucidate any further, he said he closed it as an insufficient data. So that is interesting. Um, people have commented since, and some people have commented that the object is so far away, it's hard to tell if it was a drone or not. And I suppose I agree. If there's anything it could be, it could possibly be some sort of um, quadcopter or something. But it is clearly behind the houses and then comes around in front of them, which is pretty odd. A very odd video, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. It, it seems it doesn't seem drone like to me, but that may mm-hmm. be just my, you know, it's only one like what a drone is. Yeah, yeah. so I, I would agree with you. I didn't get that feeling at first, but um, I suppose it's possible. Hmm. Hmm. That's right. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. So, yeah, that's a good one. Good one, dude. Good one. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. High five. This is another <laughs> good one. So I'm really excited about this one. I pounded this out and did, you know, um, was rushing to get this out. Uh, this story, and this is the WikiLeaks. So if anybody saw the debate this weekend, they were talking about some new WikiLeaks email. Uh, They were, uh, well, they weren't so shocking. One headline I read, which was really funny, is that um, uh, that, that the emails showed that Hillary was boring or something because uh, these were a lot of democratic, more democratic emails that were posted, including emails from Podesta, John Podesta. Now you and I, of course, have talked about Podesta quite a bit because he is uh, Hillary's campaign manager. He used to work for Obama as an advisor. He was Obama's transition um, manager when Obama took over the the white house, you know, um, eight years ago now. And uh, so very prominent figure. Uh, He was also the chief of staff for the Clintons. And he um, is very into UFOs, has been for a long time. Even during this campaign, he's kind of challenged people for a while to ask Hillary about UFOs. And he talked about Mm -hmm. UFOs in some of his tweets. He's a he's a tweeter. But his emails got hacked. And now we know um, we do know at least uh, the law enforcement has, you know, finally uh, made it official that, yes, it was Russia who has been doing these hacking of de- the Democratic Party's emails. And uh, so they did release some of his emails, again, mostly boring. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> But there are a suite of emails to him regarding UFOs. Um, most of these are pretty boring, uh, you know, just people either UFO references in the news, like there's a reference to a missile test that, you know, people mistook for a UFO, uh, a thing about Kucinich, uh, but uh, also some guy talking about uh, terrorism and some other things. One guy, this was kind of sad, who was kind of getting, he was upset about German immigration. He stated, Germany's immigration disaster deniers have as much credibility as alien abductees spirited away in a UFO with Bigfoot at the controls. <laughs> so that was one of the funny comments. There's kind of an odd one. Of course, some people believe this. I think it's kind of odd personally. There's some guy who's writing, hey, Podesta, and he, he CC'd McCain and some other people. And he's like, you got to tell Hillary she's got the climate change thing all wrong. Oh, yeah, I yeah, saw that. You saw this? It's actually Nibiru mm-hmm. or Planet X, which comes around every 3,600 years or so, and its gravity is pulling on our planet. Um, we can't see it now because it's in the sun's glare. Um, so I guess... If the astronomers would just kind of cover their eyes from the sun's glare, they'd be, oh, look, there it is. There's Nibiru. <laughs> so maybe that would help. But um, that was kind of a funny one. But one that is being made a big deal about, which is much less of a big deal than people think, is uh, this one from Edgar Mitchell. And this is kind of funny because this demonstrates how the U.K. tabloids are so terrible at reporting news. They're awful. And they get it, they over sensationalize and are just completely misleading and inaccurate. Their headline is Revealed 
Hillary Clinton had secret meetings with NASA astronaut to discuss aliens. Completely, absolutely false. So, and I have links to the actual emails so you can look at them. What had happened was there is an email to John Podesta requesting a meeting uh, with Edgar Mitchell. Now, it makes it look like the email is from Edgar Mitchell. However, if you look at the email address and you follow that, you find that it's actually from a woman named Terry Mansfield. And uh, she's somewhat, I mean, some of you might have heard of her. She's a UFO researcher. Um, her website says that they educate humans about work with our nonviolent, obedient to God, extraterrestrial intelligence from contiguous universe whose mission is to work with our scientists to bring zero point energy here for the purpose of extending life on our fragile earth. So a little fringe, wow. you know, she's kind of, and uh, she mm -hmm. says they only fundraise with billionaires. So, mm. yeah, which is kind of interesting. Anyway, that's who the email came from, either her or her colleague. She works with Suzanne. And, uh, and so the email is requesting a meeting to talk about zero point energy with Edgar Mitchell. Now, um, the question was, did Edgar Mitchell know they sent this email? He probably did. He's into this kind of stuff. They're the type of people he hung out with. So he probably did. But did Podesta reply? That's something we did not know. And mm. so that's why it was ridiculous that they assumed that there was some sort of meeting because it doesn't look like Podesta uh, replied at all. And interesting enough, Grant Cameroon, <laughs> uh, who you had on your show recently, um, he actually did some research this morning, and he was, we've been talking on Facebook, and he got a hold of Terry Mansfield, and, uh, and they said, yeah, Edgar Mitchell did ask us to send the email, but we never got a reply, and there was no meeting. So no meeting actually happened. Wow. <coughs> oh, and I now, misspoke. Let me ask I, I guess they did talk with um, Podesta's aide a little bit, um, and so uh, there was a little bit of conversation, but a meeting never happened. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. I see. Oh, that's all right. I was just wondering, whatever possessed you to call him Grant Cameroon? <laughs> I'm glad you <laughs> asked. No, I'm just joking around because, uh, Martin, of course, you had him on your show recently, and you con com commented about how he, he calls me Alejandro. That's and right. I've yeah. had, you know, I've been doing the show now for years. It used to be UFO Think Tank, but now it's Open Mind UFO Radio. And if you can go back, even when I did my first show with him, which is probably 2000, at least seven, eight years ago, you can go listen. And he calls me Alejandro. And um, even at that point, I had already known him for many, many years and been in pretty close contact. I mean, sometimes we talk more than others, but um, he's always called me that. And I kind of laugh and I kind of tell him. Uh, say that that's kind of maybe because he's Canadian and it's kind of French Canadian because it's Alejandro. Almost sounds like a yeah. little French kind of flair there. Yeah. So it's just that's, uh, very gracious of you. Yes. But mm -hmm. I do know his name is Cameron and not Cameroon. Yes. I was just being silly, silly there. <laughs> so there's not a whole lot to that one. I mean, Edgar Mitchell wanted to meet with John Podesta. No big surprise. We all think that would be cool but here's what's cool and the washington and the wall street journal actually uh wrote about these um by the way i should mention shepherd johnson uh did the research to find those other files for us at open mind so thank you to shepherd but the wall street journal did a story about some of the other ones that are, are, are actually much more interesting and these are from tom DeLong. hmm so Tom DeLonge is a rock star. Uh, you know, he was with Blink-182. And, uh, you know, actually Jason and Maureen, uh, when they were with Open Minds, interviewed Tom DeLonge. And we've got that at Open Minds. But uh, he's super into UFOs. Uh, a lot of people a few months ago made a big deal because he was making a lot of claims about knowing all these people and all this, you know, uh, deep throat contacts who know about UFOs. Mm -hmm. And he released in July of 2015 a photo of him interviewing Podesta, which many of us, like myself, Lee Spiegel, others who have been dying to interview John Podesta about UFOs, 
uh, were extremely jealous and thinking, why Tom DeLonge? Why is he talking to Tom DeLonge? But um, All right. uh, we have yet to see this interview. Uh, Tom DeLonge says it's going to be part of a, a documentary he's going to release. So we know he did talk with Podesta. Uh, and in these WikiLeaks are a couple emails from Tom DeLonge. One of them is kind of a, a update about what's going on. It's a few months after the interview in October. Tom DeLonge is saying, here's the update. I've been talking with Spielberg's people and some others about what we're going to do. I'm getting my books and stuff out. And then he says, I would like to meet with you and bring two very important people that uh, essentially have some insight into UFOs. Doesn't look like Podesta ever replied to this email. But the more interesting email is from J January 25th of this year, uh, and the t the subject is General McCasland, and Tom DeLong writes, he mentioned he's a skeptic. He's not. I've been working with him for four months. I just got done giving him a four-hour presentation on the entire project a few weeks ago. Trust me, the advice has already been happening on how to do all of this. He just has to say that out loud, but he is very, very aware as he was in charge of all that stuff. When Roswell crashed, they shipped it to the laboratory at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. General McCasland was in charge of that exact laboratory up to a couple years ago. Uh, he not only knows what I'm trying to achieve, he helped assemble my advisory team. He's a very important man. So, this General McCaslin is Major General William McCaslin, and he was the commander of the U.S. Air Force's research laboratories at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. In fact, mm. it, there's, the Air Force site doesn't say he was. It says he is, so maybe he, he was in charge of it up until recently, and they haven't updated it. But, yeah, he is actually a very important person. Wright-Patterson, of course, is where... Project Blue Book was and all of the Air Force um, UFO investigations and people do feel, you know, maybe they took the Raswell craft there. So if mm -hmm. this General McCaslin does have something more to say about UFOs that he has not told the public, that is actually very, very interesting. So um, hopefully... Uh, you know, it could be that Tom did not want that name to get out and didn't, the name of his contact to get out. I'm sure somebody's hopefully going to be asking McCaslin uh, what he had to say, and maybe he'll have a comment, especially since the Wall Street Journal wrote about this. But uh, that seems to be the most promising or most interesting of all the wiki leaks uh, out there regarding UFOs. But uh, from what I... I mm -hmm. can gather these are all of the UFO-related WikiLeaks that came out recently. And uh, that last one, pretty interesting, huh? I'll say. Yeah, that's great. Well, that would be really something. It, it's funny. It's uh, someone like Tom DeLong because of his fame, may actually get some traction and get somewhere. Yeah, I mean, according to him... You know, he's told a lot of stories. He hasn't produced much to, sh to, to back up his stories, but he says, you know, it, when he got into this, it was some people who worked at Area 51 that that went to him because he's famous. And that's what really got him connected with some of his uh, great contacts with uh, some, I guess, really good information. So, um, yeah, you're right. It could be that he really does have uh, some really great stuff. But, um so far, all he's he's released a book that's nonfiction that he says is based on some of the real stuff, but we don't know what's real or not. So, pretty. Interesting. No, it is fiction. It is fiction. You yeah. mean? it is fiction. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh, did right. I say nonfiction? Yeah, yeah it's right. fiction uh -huh. based on nonfiction, according to him. So, um, yeah, that that I think is an interesting email. I like the last one. Yeah. Awesome. You probably like the Nibiru one, right? <laughs> Yeah, that one really cracked me up. That's a good <laughs> <Yeah>. one. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty, so you got anything else, buddy? I think I'm just about done. All right. Well, thank you for taking the time out because I know you're really busy today with your antiquing. Um, but uh, thanks for taking the time to talk some UFO news with us, buddy. Yeah, always a pleasure. Okay, well, let's go ahead and talk to retired Colonel Dr. John Alexander. 
I am very happy to have back on the show John Alexander. Hello, sir. Hi, Alejandro. Great to talk to you again. Yeah, it's always fun and interesting to talk to you. Of course, uh, there's always a little bit of controversy. Uh, even, you know, you'll be speaking at the UFO Congress coming up because you're known as, you know, by some, although practically everybody who's been in the military, people believe that they're, they're part of some kind of disinformation scandal. <laughs> Well, we're we're getting a greater dose of that with the uh, current election cycle as well. Just, yeah. uh, you know, t truth no longer matters. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, conspiracy theories kind of reign supreme, uh, especially the the most dubious of them. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, it, although it kind of it seems like a bit. Uh, one of the reasons people feel that way is because you don't feel there's this, uh, the, there's so much a conspiracy of, of you know, hidden secrecy as much of a conspiracy of kind of ineptitude or just inability to uh, deal with UFOs and things like that. Um, but it seems like you kind of relish it a bit. You kind of like uh, setting the record straight to people. Great. Um, you know, as you know, first line in my book is UFOs are real. Right. Uh, and what I'm going to be talking about uh, at the upcoming conference is just the complexity that we have run into in trying to investigate these phenomena. Mm -hmm. And when you say you, oh, and super excited about your talk, because you're also going to be talking about one of your recent experiences. And is this your first UFO sighting or just kind of most spectacular? Um. <laughs> I'm not sure either, but it is the most recent. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote in the book, I had one, but it's very, very minor as uh, most UFO sightings go. Mm -hmm. uh, the significance of this is the proximity to the individual who was there telling me, it's, you know, I think something might happen, and there we are. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this ought to be, your talk ought to be really exciting. I'm, I'm very excited about it. Um, but today I want to talk about the Skinwalker Ranch because you got to be participate in the research uh, of this mysterious ranch um, because you of your friendship with uh, Bob Bigelow and, and participation in his uh, National Institute for Discovery Sciences. Um, I guess to start off with this, when did you first meet Bob Bigelow? Oh. That's uh, that goes back in antiquity. Um, <laughs> there was a conference uh, some may remember, and at MIT, that uh, John Mack uh, and the guy from MIT were holding, uh, and he showed up there. Uh, that was more like a handshake. And um, then it was a few years later, which I'm trying to think, it probably. Uh, 88, 89, I must have been the 88 time frame, and mm. uh, I was hosting a small meeting at my house, talk of people, some would be familiar with the community, others not, but interested in alternative energy and the zero point energy in particular, and Bob, out of the blue, just called me and said, what are you doing? I've heard mm. about you, and... Uh, so then he flew over, and we had a conversation, and about that time I left uh, Los Alamos uh, National Lab and then went over to work uh, for NIDS. Um, when it gets to Skinwalker, I was actually the first person to uh, from NIDS to spend the night there, and I was there the day that uh, he actually bought the ranch. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, when did you first hear about the ranch then, and what did you hear? Well, um, just some very generic rumors that there was a, a place in Utah where very strange kind of things happened, uh, and that the rancher, uh, like Terry, is pretty well known now, but... Uh, basically wanted to get out. It was harassing his family so badly, and they were taking a lot of heat from the uh, local community. 
Um, they were not Mormon, and that area really, you know, yeah, they do discriminate. Uh, but uh, as I say, family was having a lot of trouble. Well, they had had a recent uh, incident. Most of these, by the way, are written up, and uh, I did some in my book on UFOs, but uh, Skinwalker Ranch by uh, George Knapp and Colin Kelleher. But this is one in which um, he had some young boys out there and dogs, as most ranchers do. And these dogs kept jumping up and snapping at these blue balls that were, you know, floating in the air around there. And what happened was I did it and and the balls kept floating away and the dogs uh, followed them snapping and that and totally disappeared. There were three dogs. Um, And then it never came home. And then the following day, Terry went out looking because it was very unusual that the dogs wouldn't uh, return to get fed, if nothing else. Um, And he found three puddles of uh, look like fat on the ground, and he believed that uh, that was the remnants of the dog. And they were very concerned that his uh, kids might, you know, encounter the same thing and trying to tease or follow balls and uh, took them to be uh, potentially quite dangerous. Mm-hmm. Now, were was anything left when you got to the site then? Were you able to see these, these any of oh, this no, residue? There, there, you know, not from that uh, mm-hmm. particular incident, but there are so many incidents. Mm-hmm. And um, as you know, a number that happened when our investigators were there, I would say, uh, to be honest, I, I was up at the ranch a number of times uh, after mm-hmm. that, and frankly, personally, had not seen any particular incident. But there were people, and some will know Eric, uh, who seemed to be kind of ultra-sensitive and a lot of things happened around him. So it, not only do you have an, a geographic area that has, uh, you know, a huge number of incidents that are just totally unexplainable, uh, but there does seem to be a certain personality uh, dependence uh, as well, mm-hmm. influence on the area or what happens. Hmm. When So you probably were... Since you were the first there, uh, I'm assuming you got to interview the family. Oh yeah, we we knew them quite well, and as you know, Nids had a science advisory board that was, uh, you know, highly respectable, and uh, they came in and you know were very gracious and very open uh, about the events uh, that were going on there. Mm-hmm. and totally did not, you know, no understanding of how these things could happen. They did indicate that it, it did not originate with them, that strange things have been going on there. And Bob had talked to the uh, <clears throat> Native American tribes in the area, and this was sort of known as a place that they did not want to go to, uh, that uh, bad things could happen there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So did you advise then, uh, did you recommend that Bob Bigelow um, purchase the land and do further studies? No, no, no that was uh, his uh, decision. Uh, um, that's where he makes decisions anyway. But um, I thought that maybe we could, you know, since incidents happen at such a, continuous rate that it offered the possibility of being, you know, basically a, a field laboratory. Um, now, the, uh, you know, NIDS was designed to look at two specific areas, uh, UFOs as one, continuation of consciousness, and beyond bodily death was uh, the other. So this fit in quite well. And um, with with the charter and the things that Bob was interested in uh, at that time. And so we, um, you know, picked it up. You had a willing thing. Now, one of the things I want to emphasize, though, 
this was, in fact, and I think continues to be, a working ranch. So it also has to do with just raising cattle. So a lot of people like to say, oh, we, you know, wasted, I think, the, it was around a quarter of a million dollars on it. Said, no, you're, you're picking up a working ranch that uh, continues to have value. Mm-hmm. So did you find the family uh, convincing yourself? Oh, they were very open and very convincing. And, of course, the, the thing beyond that was the number of incidents that happened with our observers uh, and others on site. So we're not strictly relying on, you know, personal stories by uh, an individual uh, many, many stories, a large number of witnesses, uh, physical evidence uh, that pretty, pretty hard to deny uh, and pretty hard to explain under any set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. When Bob purchased the ranch, I would imagine, and, and you can let me know whether I'm right or not, there might have been – was there any hesitation? Was there kind of like, wow, uh, he bought this place. What if we're going to put all these resources into it? What if nothing happens? Um, at the beginning, were people a little nervous that way? Oh, well, not, not that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. um, things Now, having said that, um, one of the things about the ranch, and I think why they really gave up the, you know, continuous uh, – observation was that it, it was a bit cyclical, if you will. Hmm. In other words, there would be periods of intense activity and then other periods where virtually nothing uh, would happen. So, and the other thing, you know, one of the, remember in my book, I wrote about what I call precognitive sentient phenomena. And it actually came from our observation uh, at the ranch. And I guess colloquially, a lot of folklore uh, revolves around the trickster. In other words, that there's phenomena that happen, but there's something behind it that seems to have, you know, a tricking uh, kind of uh, uh, attributes to it. Uh, and this shows up throughout literature, uh, you know, for centuries um but the reason i was looking at it is uh, as you know we instrumented the ranch um had various kind of sensors we had video and doing you know monitoring 24 7 reviewing everything that happens and the phenomena had it seemed like the ability to function just outside of wherever the sensors were mm -hmm. meaning and this is why I came precognitive. It seemed to know whatever it was, and it was in charge, if you will. But it knew what we were going to do when we were presented with various phenomena. And you know, every time we would say we would adjust to it and say, "Oh, okay, let's study that." And every time he did, it would shift slightly, like it was saying, "Oh, you like that? Try this," <laughs> you know, and you get something totally unexpected. Mm -hmm. Often, for instance, like just off camera or something of that nature. Can you remember an incident that uh, was kind of a, an example of this? Well, there's a classic one written to, uh, in the book, and one in which we had uh, four poles. As I said, we, were, we had set up uh, surveillance, and what happened, you had video cameras, on top of uh, 20 foot poles, all looking uh, to the west. Uh, and in this case, uh, the poles to, further to the east could see the poles uh, to the west. Um, and what happened was that, okay, so in order to install the cameras, you had wires that were, you know, coming from the camera down to the ground. You had probably half a roll of duct tape on uh, each of the poles just holding the wires in. As you got close to the ground, you had PVC piping and U-clamps that held the wires down, and then they went underground because as a working ranch, you still had cattle running around there. And this ran back to a um, uh, 
house, uh, the housing where we stayed, and so you and you had time lapse on a second or third between uh, each frame. But again, running 24/7, and this phenomenal incident that happens, we know that all of a sudden, uh, camera, I'll just call it camera one, the one further to the west stops recording. Uh, and the camera to the east behind it does not record anything. Now, not only did it, the camera stop recording, the wires at the top of the 20-foot pole were pulled loose. There was a chunk of uh, about three foot of wire in between that were missing, and then the PVC that held the uh, the U clamps that, that held the PVC pipe had been pulled loose, and so we went in and looked at the camera that was staring at the camera where the incident had taken place, and coincidentally, the cattle had been milling around the pole at that time. Importantly. Absolutely nothing showed up. Mm -hmm. And what we knew, the reason the cattle location was important, we knew that if anybody approached the cattle uh, or anything came in there, they would always scatter. In this case, they hadn't. And we know from the time that it's the uh, wires were pulled loose when the recording stopped, so we knew where to look. And absolutely nothing of any of the things that we described show up on the camera that was facing it and should have recorded the entire incident. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? So, I mean, you, you did have video footage of the pool. You just couldn't see the wires. Um, being... Oh, no, you, nothing happened. That's the point. Uh -huh. I mean, we should have been able to see if something Somebody climbed up the pole and we'd have, you know, again, 20 feet or so and pulled yeah. it, jerked it loose. You should have seen whatever went up there. Mm -hmm. You should have seen whatever cut this, uh, you know, yard long chunk of wire out of the middle. You should have seen something pull the U clamps and the PVC loose. See, again, not only did we not see that, we also did not see the cattle move. And they certainly, if if anybody had done it, you know, or any normal uh, thing had done that, they would have scattered and mm -hmm. didn't. Yeah, so pretty strange stuff. Now, what do you remember, uh, you know, when did, uh, once the investigation began, NIDS investigation, did uh, strange stories then start coming very quickly? Did they begin experiencing? I'm not sure. What do you mean? I mean, we had had strange stories. It was the I guess reason we picked up the ramps to go back. You mean our incidents? Exactly. So the investigators, did they begin experiencing um, things? Well, one of the things I want to emphasize, you know, I had a little go-round with uh, Jesse Ventura and, uh, and his conspiracy series show that he did about Skinwalker Ranch, and he, he asked me, uh, could I you know, get him on the ranch. And I said, no. And the other thing was, by the way, you'd be uh, quite bored. Uh, my point here is that, yes, a lot of very phenomenal incidents happened. But when you amortize that over six years, it is not like, oh, something happens every night. Uh, I understand that the people up there are still being harassed with uh, folks trying to sneak in and uh, whatnot. So it wasn't happening on a continuous basis. The ones that did happen were very, very dramatic uh, and you know, literally unexplainable. But um, it's not like you sit out there and, and every hour some unusual thing or UFO pops in or lights appear or uh, various kind of apparitions or what I call creepy crawlers show up. Mm -hmm. All of those things happened. But again, you spread that over, over the six years that the observations that are observations alone, some of the incidents had happened to Terry and his family before. And some of the stories even predate, uh, 
uh, carry. Mm -hmm. So the anomalous lights, for instance, did that uh, occur? Uh, were any of those being able to be recorded or, or seen by uh, the NIDS investigators? Uh, there were various things that were seen. Um, the I don't recall uh, blue bulbs. I, I think we saw luminous lights uh, on occasion. Um, uh, some of it, uh, Eric recorded and, and or reported an incident out in the trees, which were uh, there was uh, you know. Russian Olives further to the west in a building out there and he talked about something moving through the trees akin to what you saw in the Predator movie you know where what you really see is the distortion not uh, you know firm details of a specific object mm -hmm. and and Eric you're, it, that's Dr. Eric Davis is that correct? If he chooses to be uh, known, he's pretty well known, yeah. Yeah, I think he's even done a few, not many, but a few interviews um, regarding... Uh, yeah, well, he is, uh, uh, you know, he, he's a legitimate astrophysicist, uh, works for Hal put off now, and does a lot of work in, in anomalies, but a very credible guy. Mm -hmm. I would emphasize that one of the things that was different about NIDS is that uh, most of the observers uh, that we had up there uh, all had at least one doctorate. Uh, and in one case, the guy had was a double doctorate uh, at that. Uh, trained, highly trained researchers and, uh, you know, uh, interested in the phenomena. Uh, Mm -hmm. Some of them fundamentally skeptical because, because, as I say, you run up against trying to explain how any of these things could occur, and it just literally defies explanation. Mm -hmm. Well, what's interesting, and I, I saw this on a mainstream show, but he also talked about this, I believe, at a MUFON symposium a few years ago, um, and uh, we've talked to him about it. I don't know that we have anything published on it, but... Um, Eric, Dr. Davis, who you're referring to, has talked about, you know, witnessing one of the most bizarre um, incidents at, that uh, happened during the study. Um, and I was wondering if you could uh, recall. Well, I don't know, but bizarre is, uh, bizarre is relative in this case. There's, right. There's, you know, even orders of magnitude of bizarre. I mean, the one I described uh, about the camera, I think, is one of the strangest where the damn thing was actually instrumented and yet recorded nothing. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it was Davis um, talking about sort of a portal or something they had seen. Well, we're a bit into conjecture uh, at that point, but mm. yeah, a lot of us did sort of think that and that's part of the folklore is that there are, and uh, I'm not sure if you're talking about the one where something came up out of a hole or there were other instances where holes were reported like in the sky with things dropping down like UFOs and sounds coming out of the sky. That uh, So uh, portal... You know, if you will, the New Age vernacular is pretty, pretty generic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe this was a story where something came out of the ground, some sort of. Okay, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm very, very, quite, quite familiar with that one. Again, there were two observers. Um, just to lay it out, mm -hmm. the the ranch itself is mostly very flat, uh, open, uh, but to the north. Uh, there's an escarpment that rises a, a couple of hundred feet. And so one of the things we would do is post people. In fact, when I mentioned the first night that I stayed there, that's what I did was to climb up on this escarpment where you could look down and see most of the ranch. Um, in this case, there was a 
dirt road that was running from east to west uh, at the bottom uh, of the escarpment. And one of the things that happened, that, uh, I believe it was around 2 or 3 in the morning, they were getting ready to close up shop and looked down and they saw this faint glow of light that appeared you know, like slightly above the ground. I, the guess is, I think it was around three feet or so, uh, actually above the ground. And then the light sort of expanded uh, to a wider circumference. And then all of a sudden, something with a head and shoulders popped up out of that, uh, pulled itself out, jumped down as if on the ground, and went running off. Um, now, this was observed from a few hundred feet away. Again, they're up above looking down at the incident happened. Um, this dirt road that I mentioned was very dusty, and one of the interesting things went down to where they saw it happen, and there were no footprints. Mm-hmm. Very, very strange. And I'm sure you felt, uh, I would assume you felt that these uh, reports were credible. Yeah, these are our guys. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, we're not talking about civilian reports uh, coming in uh, and whatnot. These were people who uh, worked with us uh, that happened to have been one civilian researcher who came in from outside NIDS, but uh, somebody we implicitly uh, trusted and they were using some pretty good night vision equipment uh, at the time um but again it depends on which which events but several of them had the one i talked about with something moving through the branches of the olive tree and eric perceived a message uh, and this is more like a telepathic inference that said, we are watching you. Wow. Uh, no inference as to who we are or what what that meant or what happens uh, if they do actions other than watching or, or what that uh, might mean. Uh, I would say we, to the best of my knowledge, never had an incident in which humans were directly threatened or uh, injured. Mm -hmm. Now, a animals did get injured, and there's a, uh, a specific uh, case of cattle mutilation that, again, defies uh, explanation. And uh, if you want, we can discuss that one. Yeah, great. Go ahead and describe that um, event. Yeah, well, well, this one is truly amazing because it's uh, calving season. Um, now, this does uh, start with uh, Terry. As I said, it's a working ranch, so it's a bright, sunny day. Again, the landscape in this area is totally open, so you can see for quite a ways. So he goes in his truck, and he finds a, a mother and a newborn calf, and so the procedure is to weigh the calf, take data, and then you put a tag in the calf's ear that it, and with the mother, so it's identified, um, you know, what that relationship is. So he does that, and he drives uh, a few, few hundred meters, but again, straight line, totally visible, uh, finds another newborn calf, and he tags that and weighs that. Interim times, maybe between half an hour, 45 minutes, and he comes back, and the first cow is just beside herself, and calf one is dead. And not only is it dead, uh, the ear has, with the tag has been sliced off. Uh, looks like something extremely sharp had done that. It had been eviscerated and exsanguinated, um, and uh, there was about, the, now the remains were about 20 pounds less than what it had weighed 20 minutes ago. Um, we sent, um, we had Georgia Nett, who was a, a DVM, among things, up to the ranch that day. We had protected the uh, 
carcass, make sure nothing happened to it. Uh, again, there were a lot of slicing, and uh, one bone was uh, moved out. Looked like some nicks from a sharp knife on it. But um, uh, one of the things I, I had them do, uh, uh, people said, oh, uh, simple, uh, it was bled out and just, you know, blood went into the ground. So I suggested, and they went to a nearby slaughterhouse and got a few quarts of blood and came back in the area, and we just poured it on the ground to see what would happen. And weeks later, you could go by and say, oh, that's where the blood was poured on the ground. Mm -hmm. Yet at the point of the exsanguinated calf, um, no marks whatsoever. And we looked at, you know, every possibility of uh, uh, predation, uh, you know, um, not the way big deer, uh, big bears uh, kill, uh, not the way big cats, and there are a few uh, in the area, um, but there were no known predators that could have carried this out. One of the hypotheses was that it might be human. And, you know, they probably still shoot cattle rustlers. But the point is that, again, this is broad daylight, mid-morning, totally open visibility. Nobody in their right mind is, you know, going to sneak across an open field and cut up somebody's calf like that. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, being so, ex exsanguinated, like you said, the blood being taken, I mean, it would have had totally, to been yeah. collected and then removed. Um, right. Which would have been well, difficult that, that process. That is a point. It, it was. It wasn't just drained where it went into the ground, um, and that's why I had the experiment run, uh, pouring blood on the ground to see what it did look like, and had pretty good comparative analysis of that. Mm -hmm. So, how did this? I mean, uh, what was your reaction to all of this? Did, did this change your worldview? Did it have? Uh, I would imagine this had to be pretty shocking for people. Well, it changed my, not my worldview, no. Uh, um, but then I have a pretty broad worldview, and I've mm -hmm. been involved in phenomena for decades and have seen some really, really strange things in other locations. Um, certainly this was one of the more highly concentrated areas and ones in which you had this variety uh, of phenomena that were occurring and defying, you know, scientific explanation and attempts to do research. Uh, that, hence, that's why I said it was a precognitive sentient phenomena. It knew what we were going to do. It seemed to know how we would respond and what kinds of research we would attempt to do. Uh, and yet present things that were ineffable. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, this is a group of, of scientists, for the most part, very intelligent people right. that were outsmarted, essentially, by some unknown phenomena. Yeah, yeah. It's in charge. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, it's in charge. Yeah. I mean... Yeah, that, that, that may be one of the more scary aspects. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would imagine, like... Dr. Davis, for instance, wrote a paper on teleportation uh, for the Air Force. Um, I think a lot of people assume his experiences uh, with the ranch kind of influenced uh, his his thinking, or at least opened his mind about you know some some uh, possibilities uh, and uh, you know what physics is capable of. Um, did any of those scientists ex express you know a? a any emotional reaction or, you know, just uh, I would imagine, especially for someone who, who isn't as familiar with paranormal as yourself, um, even yeah. myself, well, if I had experienced that, I mean, it would really leave a mark. <laughs> yeah, well, it certainly left a mark. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Um, as you know, I've been seeing the stuff in voodoo in uh, Africa and things that just cannot be uh, explained as well. Uh, a lot in South America and dealing with shamans in the Amazon and various incidents in Brazil. Um, so, 
I would. I, I got to remind that again. We had the science advisory board that was world class by any standard. Now, of course, we selected people who were open to the possibility of phenomena. Uh, some of them were probably not as experienced, with others like Jacques Vallée, who this sort of fit in with the passport to Magonia. Um, but uh, changing, no, it just fit in. It, it's a, a bunch of pieces to a much, much larger puzzle. Mm-hmm. So everybody was pretty professional about it. Nobody kind of... Oh, uh, very, very much, yeah. No, nobody and lost had, their composure. We, well, uh, well, no, but again, this was a highly select body was being exposed to uh, a number of phenomena in other cases that NID was uh, looking into uh, mm-hmm. as well. I mean, if, if they had not been open-minded uh, about the phenomena, they would not have been invited to the board, so... Mm-hmm. That kind of goes without saying. Now, I I think if you went to the National Academy of Science and presented this, they'd tell you you were crazy. <laughs> I mean, first of all, you wouldn't even get them to look, which is, I think, part of the problem is that when you have phenomena that seem to out, um, lie outside normally accepted uh, bounds, it's just a priori dismissed. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also, you know, one of my that he's looking at this on a global basis. Um, Yeah, that's true in the West, uh, but there are other societies, even those that are very Western-oriented, highly well-educated, who are much more accepting of these uh, various phenomena. Mm -hmm. So, in all, do you feel... um as a group, the scientific board and Bob Bigelow and yourself, I mean, because it was one step ahead, was the the experiment a failure in not being able to um, uh, record a phenomena or uh, how do you feel people felt about that? Um, well, I, I wouldn't, I, I could never say it was a failure. Mm-hmm. And that was because we did have so many observations. Uh, it also means, no, we did not come up with the answer. And, I, you know, as you know, the last paragraph of my UFO book, which I think is directly related, says that, uh, you know, I don't think we're at the point of asking the right questions. Mm-hmm. I think that what we have is so terribly complex that it is beyond our imagination and that when we attempt to, you know, do research projects, it's almost laughable. The other problem is it is very difficult to get the best and brightest minds. I'm, you know, as you know, very familiar with the UFO community. Uh, I think many of them are very well-meaning, but uh, unfortunately often not qualified to you know, get into these uh, scientific areas. That said, if the PSP is right, it wouldn't matter anyway. Mm-hmm. Well, and and even though I, I, some individuals are capable and intelligent, um, any serious study requires organization and resources, uh, and that's something that unfortunately uh, doesn't seem to happen. Um, especially when people are self-guided and have just different ideas about how to go about the research. Well, it's that, and quite frankly, uh, funding is potentially another issue. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I use the Large Hadron Collider as an example. Uh, globally, we put uh, over $18 billion into that, looking for the God particle, uh, found the Higgs boson, and then went from there and say, whoops, that wasn't it. And then we found pentaquarks. Uh, but we have this mechanical model of the universe that says if we cut things into smaller and smaller parts, we will eventually, you know, find the, the essential building block. It does not appear to take into account the role of consciousness. Uh, or a multiverse, uh, you know, we have multidimensional universes that are interacting from time to time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, limited by what is known often. 
it seems. So, well, the, the problem, from a scientific perspective, is, in my view, the problem is that we start with the assumption mm -hmm. that, you know, it's a materialistic universe, and we do not, in general, accept even the possibility of spiritual interaction. And I think that's a fundamental mistake. Mm-hmm. By a spiritual interaction, do you mean kind of like an unknown force, uh, and, but a force that um, is ever present, I suppose, at least um, in the human body? Well, or Well, there are several aspects to that. Um, as you know, my doctorate, I did a lot of work in thanatology and looking at uh, near-death experiences. And again, the continuation of consciousness beyond bodily death. And I think the evidence in favor is uh, extremely strong. Um, but again, when I've traveled the world, uh, you come to societies that talk about interaction with spiritual beings mm -hmm. that guide the entire life and uh, interact uh, with them, sometimes on a very physical plane. Again, you know, Western world, we tend to disregard that uh, without even accepting the possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, you do run into, and I don't want to get into religious arguments about, you know, what does that mean? Is there a soul? And how does that uh, uh, fit into the process? But I, I think there are pieces uh, to that puzzle that uh, are associated. Mm -hmm. Or and, and along the lines of what you referred to earlier with the ranch, a, a sort of non-physical uh, intelligence or consciousness. Yeah, and, and the reason I use precognitive sentient is that, like I said, it was so smart that it knew what we were going to do. Mm -hmm. And clearly intelligent and clearly in control. Mm-hmm. Well, and some theoretical physicists uh, do theorize on possible uh, forces we're not aware of or even uh, particles we're not aware of that could make up and explain some of this and allow for um, non-physical uh, consciousness. And, and Well, there are folks who are working particularly on quantum mechanics and trying to explain what that is, uh, much to their frustration. Mm -hmm. Uh, because they never quite get it. Um, but, uh, again, the, the basic, if you start with a premise that everything is material and be, you know, can be cut up into smaller and smaller parts, that really limits your options when you get to explaining the veridical observations that take place and in daily life. I mean, you know, like, you know, Near-death experiences, for instance, in the U.S., there are millions of people who have had these experiences. Um, and it's only, you know, kind of one example. You have others. You know, we used to teach psychokinesis, um, no physical way to explain the energy necessary to cause that to occur. Um, and, you know, from ghosts to, you know, you know pick your phenomena. There's some pretty hard evidence for all of those things. Um, speaking of, you know, measurements and, and things like that, um, were, I mean, was there any success or or regularity to maybe such as you, the use of Geiger counters or EMF or, or were you able to measure anything like that that you felt um, was related to the phenomena? Oh, yeah, the... Um... Uh, one of the applications we had were various EMF meters and things of that nature went out there. Yeah, you would find pretty unusual fluctuation. I don't recall any radiological uh, variation. Uh, that does appear in other phenomena as well. Uh, classically, the uh, Bentwaters case is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. um, but you, uh, again, wh whatever it is, seems to defy our ability to quantify it. Mm -hmm. And you did mention it, so I, I gotta ask, even though I don't think we have time to really get into it. But you did mention 
psychokinesis and training it. So are you saying that you've witnessed, um, you know, the ability to, of, of people to move objects with their, their oh, mind? Uh, ab- ab- absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's probably a whole other story. But, uh, yeah. yeah, no, I used to actually teach. Uh, Jack Hauk had uh, come up with a means of, it got to be known as spoon bending parties, or we call PKMB, psychokinesis, um, metal bending, and it was based on the work of uh, Uri Geller. Um, but we then had something that was teachable. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, the problem here was did it happen 100% of the time? No. Uh, but there were examples where we had very, very dramatic uh, experiences that happened, you know in front of me and and many many others and highly highly credible uh, witnesses and if you use the mechanistic model of the world one of the things you have to say is okay if if this metal bent where did the energy come from and i'm talking here about the kinds of things metal bending where there's no physical force applied um and you really cannot come up with a uh uh, an explanation. Mm-hmm. Were you able to do it? Uh, not well. I've had some things happen, um, but uh, as I said, I was able to uh, teach the process and observe others that had some pretty spectacular events occur. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's amazing. But I guess getting back to the ranch, some final questions. Do you feel that, um, I know Bob, Bigelow has has sold the ranch, so it might not have, I I have no idea how expensive of an effort this investigation into the ranch was, but do you believe he felt it was um, money well spent in the end? Uh, I'm sorry, you'd have to ask him. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I have no idea. I was not even aware that he actually sold the ranch, so I had heard there were other uh, folks in there. Probably the biggest expenditure, however, would have been on uh, salary for those of us working there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, again, it was a working ranch and maintained, you know, its uh, 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 property value. So, mm-hmm. so, and uh, the family that he bought the ranch from, uh, I understand, stayed. To work the ranch for a period of time, is that correct? A short period of time, yes. Mm-hmm, before leaving, and then I guess after yeah. that he well, did. They, 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 they were terribly harassed by the community. Things mm-hmm. did not go well. Wow. Uh, wife lost her job uh, in the bank, uh, directly related to that. The kids were getting harassed in school as, oh, wow. as these stories became known. So yeah, the public is uh, is not kind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I guess that's... Uh, On one side, you you have people who say, wow, isn't that interesting? But Mm -hmm. the reality is that, man, liable to bite you. Yeah. Yeah, these stories lately, there's a couple of stories that came up this week, and that's why I thought it would be good to um, talk about this. Well, in the last few weeks, uh, George Knapp, of course, who wrote the book, Skinwalker, or The Hunt for Skinwalker, has uh, kind of put those on his Facebook, and that's how I became aware of them. It's by the Wink. Yeah, I, I saw that on his posts as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and one of those is and about. I, I, mm-hmm. No, I was going to say I, I would really emphasize for folks that are interested to get those uh, George's and uh, Colin's oh, right. book. And, and to not go to the ranch, and that was the whole point. It seems like that oh, prompted yeah. these stories. Is that, uh, in fact, the title of the the first one that came out on September twenty fourth. Uh, of the two recent stories written by the UB Media is uh, Skinwalker Ranch Activity Shifts from Paranormal to Prosecutable because these guys are, are no longer experiencing or haven't experienced, that, at least that they've shared with the public, any paranormal experiences, the new owners, I mean. However, they're getting uh, harassed by humans who keep trying to come yeah. on to the ranch or just walk around yeah. the ranch, and uh, it's it's really been a difficult yeah. ordeal for them it was unfortunate from the start it's one of the reasons uh, the general location was not well known while while we were there some people figured it out but uh, yeah it's unfortunately that uh, these quote researchers 
uh, are, you know, just really screwing it up. And this is private property belongs to somebody else. They have every right to uh, maintain their privacy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, in the end, I don't know if you have any comments about... I find it unfortunate how much of this field uh, treats Bob Bigelow because I really feel that his efforts were not in vain uh, and not unsuccessful in that uh, I've been able to interview George and Colm Kelleher and Eric Davis and others who are very, very credible people who did some great work and uh, made a genuine effort to investigate this phenomena and all walked away uh, like you've expressed saying, wow, whatever this is, was was a real intelligence that just outsmarted us. Um, and that alone is is very valuable, I think, for all of us looking into this topic. I mean, we wouldn't know about this phenomena at this ranch if it wasn't for Bigelow's efforts. But unfortunately, it right. seems his legacy is, uh, and is not often treated well by the UFO community. Oh, silly girl. <laughs> What's happening? Yeah, if, if you remember the um, uh, my slides uh, that I use in, in most of my briefings, and it says you got to have three things uh, if, if you're going to play, um, and uh, you better have a thick skin because you're going to be attacked. Uh, you must understand conspiracy theory because you're going to be part of it, whether you believe the conspiracy or not. And finally, for most people, you better have a day job because you're not <laughs> going to make a lot of money at it. Amen to all three of those points. And amen to your entire book. I think it's one of the most important books in this field. Uh, it's definitely out of the top ten. I think you know people need to understand just because you outline – Things like this, um, you know, that are important observations of the field overall and something you do need to understand when you're diving in because, like you said, you will get attacked. <laughs> yeah, the uh, UFO community is uh, not kind. They're, they tend to be a bit cannibalistic. <laughs> yeah, and you don't have to worry about attacks from aliens or Bigfoot or any other paranormal phenomena. The attacks by the humans are the ones you want to look out for. Right. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show again. Uh, your website is john Al johnbalexander.com where people can read more. They can see your book and how to get there. And also follow all of your adventures around the world. I was just thinking today you're a person who they ought to make a reality television show about because you're all over the world doing exciting things lately. What Swimming with the sharks. Yeah, we're just back from diving with the uh, great white sharks. Yeah. It's quite amazing. Pretty exciting stuff. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Andro. Thank you so much to John Alexander for being on the show. Remember, you can find his book uh, along with all of his information at John B. Alexander. Dot com and all of his adventures. He's all over the world. He's doing cool stuff. He's swimming with the sharks. He's he's talking to uh, gurus and um, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And he'll be talking about a lot of this crazy stuff at the 2017 UFO Congress. So definitely come and check it out. So I personally love hearing from John. So thank you so much for being on the show. And the Skinwalker Ranch is just such a fascinating topic really incredible stuff um and it's really good there's a lot of conjecture out there about bob bigelow his intentions and and such and i think it's it's best to get it from the horse's mouth i mean when it comes to move on sorry folks i was there i was part i was part of the board i was one of the directors not part of the board necessarily but in the board meetings because i was a director with move on when they created that relationship um and I've spoken with many of the people involved with NIDS. And, you know, it was it's a genuine effort to investigate strange phenomena. And uh, I think that's fascinating and really cool. But uh, it's great to hear from the people who have this inside information. And one of those is George Knapp. So remember, if you want, if you don't know much about this ranch and you're thinking, what the heck? This sounds crazy. Go check out the book. Hunt for the Skinwalker uh, by George Knapp and Colm Kelleher. Colm is another guy I've spoken with. Um, great guy. He still works for Bob Bigelow. 
So go check out that book. You can find it, I believe, definitely find it on Amazon, but I think you can find it in many of the bookstores uh, even to this day. So really, really, really good stuff. And of course, come to the conference to listen to John speak. I don't know if I've told you all too, I've posted practically all the speakers. So we have almost all the speakers listed. The last one is um, Erling Strand, who is a professor at the Oslo um, College and University, I think it's called, in Denmark, uh, Usgard or something like that. It's got, I, don't, I can't, I don't remember the name right now. But um, anyways, it's this university that is doing actual investigation of the Hesdalen Lights, which is one of the longest ongoing kind of UFO investigations and one of the few, if, if not the only, by an actual university. But Erling Strand will be coming from Norway to come and speak about the Hesdalen Lights, give you details, show you videos. I mean, there are videos of these UFOs that uh, have been captured by these, uh, you know, scientists and other uh, investigators. So he will also be speaking at the UFO Congress. So we've got a great lineup. And of course, I'll be telling you more about these speakers as time goes on. Uh, as you heard me talk about with Mark earlier, uh, I mean, with um, Martin earlier, uh, we do have another UFO magazine video coming out. This will be more about um, UFO reporting uh, by the government. So more about official UFO reporting you probably don't know about. Just evidence uh, documenting that the government certainly has been interested in UFOs since 1969, despite what they've been telling the public. And it's right there in their own files. So how have they been reporting and investigating those? We'll get into that in the next video. So keep an eye out there. Uh, we did also have uh, Michael Kleinitz putting together these videos uh, from our archives of strange UFO videos. Uh, ufo photographs so you can check that out michael has some new ones so go check our youtube for all of this crazy and wild, all of this crazy and wild stuff really really good stuff out there also if you want to read more about anything that martin and i talked about in the ufo news earlier you can go to openminds.tv in fact those stories we talked about including all of the links to all of those wikileak emails from Podesta that we talked about really interesting developments you can go find uh, and also links to like the Wall Street Journal story uh, and other stories about all of this so really I gotta say you'll probably get the most information about Podesta and those links uh, uh, those wiki leaks at our site than any other site out there openminds.tv that's right, folks. So remember also some of the past lectures from the International UFO Congress you can find on our website. You can subscribe to our video portal for a very low monthly fee and get access to tons and tons of lectures and videos. And uh, and that's also where you can find out information about the UFO Congress. You can register. You can also go to UFO Congress.com. So we've got lots and lots of really cool stuff going on. We're just keeping busy, making sure to continue to...